It's an absolute pleasure to welcome the Tottenham and England player Eric Dyer to High Performance. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So you've listened to a few of these. Yes. So you yes. know how we start. Yep. What is, in your mind, High Performance? <laughs> well, I listened to Dan Carter yesterday and I don't really know how to follow that. <laughs> um, I was thinking about this like last night and this morning and how I'd, how I'd answer that question because for me, like I don't feel like I've... I've nailed it yet, you know, like I feel like there's still quite a, quite a way to go for me. But the two things that I think um, for me would stand out, the, the first one is consistency, I think, to be, to be able to perform at a high level consistently, I think is something that um, is the hardest thing to achieve. And I think if you look at the best in, in my field and, and others, you know, to be able to perform consistently at a high level over many years is, is something that after being in, in professional football for for almost 10 years now, like I look, I look at that and just think, wow, you know, like to, be, to have that consistency of performance and uh, output is incredible. And then I think performing, performing under pressure, just in, a, in that environment, to be able to take your chance, I think, when you get it, I think that's, that's a huge thing. That comes with a little bit of luck given getting that chance, that first chance, I think you always need that little bit of luck, but then being able to take it in that moment um, and then doing it over and over again in the pressurized situations, I think would be the two things for me, yeah. It's a great answer to the opening question, but what's interesting is you felt the need to preface it by saying, well, I don't really feel I'm at a high performance level. Like if you could go yeah. back to a seven or eight year old Eric and say, you're going to play in a Champions League final, you're going to play for a decade in the Premier League, one of the biggest clubs in the country, represent England yeah. at major tournaments, score a penalty when it really mattered for the country, <laughs> all of those things. I think the seven or eight-year-old you would have said, yeah, of course you know what high performance is. Yeah. So let, let's flip it on the head then. And when I s ask that question and you say, oh, I don't really think I'm there yet, mm. what, what about you is not there yet? What's your sort of biggest area that you still feel you're learning and growing in? Um... Well, I think that's just part of like part of my nature, and I think many people around me, their nature is our nature is always that we want to, we want more, and we always want to do better, and we sort of never sit back. I I, ne I never really sit back and think like, oh, well done for the other day. <laughs> I'm just constantly looking looking forward, and and you don't really have that time. I, I guess COVID really was the first time that you really had that opportunity. I really had that opportunity. I think many people maybe. Um, but f yeah, for me, it's that consistency. I think being able to, I think there's there's definitely there's definitely been uh, periods of time, and even even I think a few seasons that I can name where I feel like I was really performing at a high level consistently for the whole season. But for me, it's just about trying to consistently perform at, at a level which I think I can, and and um, I think there are moments where I really do perform at a, a good level and one that I'm, I'm satisfied with. But I think, um, yeah, that consistency to improve and, and to perform at a high level is, is really what I'm striving for, yeah. So when COVID came along then and you had the chance to reflect on your career for the first time, mm. what kind of conclusions did you reach? I don't think it was so much about reflecting oh, my career, but I feel like COVID... Um, Dave Chappelle said this, and I, f I really like. Uh, um, I'm stealing his thing. I don't want to. Don't want to say it was me that said it, but um, like it was like you. It, get, it gave everyone the chance where, well, not the chance. They had to. You had to like sit down with your decisions and sit down with. You had to sit down with whatever that might be in in your job, in your personal life, uh, who your friends are, who your friends aren't. Um, you had to kind of sit down with those decisions and in the day to day we're moving so fast and everything's happening that you can you can be in a bad relationship or you can uh, be doing something at work that um but you're sort of just like you know yeah. it, it's it's the cracks are covered over by other things you're doing and constantly moving whereas you had to sort of sit with them for a long period of time so i think it gave me the time just to reflect on those decisions and Am I happy with this? Am I happy doing this? Um, am I happy living in this way? You know, and I came out of COVID like I think changing quite a few things just because it gave you that time to sit and and reflect on what them. What did yeah. you change? 
I feel like I've really simplified my life uh, out of COVID and, and obviously a few of those things start creeping back in now that we've been out of it for a little bit. But I feel like I just really simplified my life and, and what was important to me and what wasn't and, and um, you know, trying to cut out all of those things. And I remember the feeling I had coming back to play football again and going to training. And um, that was, uh, you know, I'm just trying to maintain that feeling because I felt like a I felt like a kid playing football again because we it had been taken away from you for so long, and I just really like try to keep hold of that enthusiasm and that freedom I felt when I was playing in that time. Yeah. And so, what had got in the way and pre-COVID and in this period after it that had stopped that enthusiasm? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think like there was like one specific thing that I was like, oh no, like what what are you doing? But it it um, you know like when I was uh, during COVID, I was I was like I kept I kept a routine and obviously life became very simple, you know, because you couldn't do all those things. And I just think I was a lot happier. I was just I was a lot happier in 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 that environment, you know, where where like you you weren't doing a lot of things that you would have been doing before that you might have thought were good for you or you might have thought were bad for you but you were doing them and you sort of just going along and things build up over time so when you had to strip all those things back and it was just a much simpler lifestyle i i found that i enjoyed that a lot more and i felt a lot happier you know so it's one yeah. of the challenges with being a professional footballer maintaining that individuality and i'm talking about even to the point of coming and have a conversation like us on here yeah you know it's a pack mentality because you're in a team mm. so everyone does the same as everyone else and they get yeah. the same wash bags and cars yeah, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> nightclubs and tattoos and they talk the same do you know what i mean yeah. it's like did you have to learn to be a bit braver then do you think um well i always credit like two guys for me when i was coming up at tottenham um that like for me, I, I feel I feel that I was extremely lucky to to have to be in that squad in general. Uh, the manager that I had, uh, the squad that we had built, I feel like I was really lucky and not really going down that kind of avenue. I don't. I'm, I feel like I'm quite. My parents from a young age, me. I've got a big fan, lots of brothers and sisters. For, we're all very. Uh, strong-minded so we I, I never did and my brothers and sisters neither we never really went with the crowd or my parents were quite really strong on that they never did and it, you know we sort of that sort of came off on us as well um, but yeah I was so Musa Dembele and Jan Vertonghen who were at Tottenham and older than me and uh, I sort of I recognize I think I recognize that those are the kind of guys I want to be with that that I like the way they they them? lead their lives outside of football. Um, just that they really did have they really had that where nothing really affected them. Nothing affected them. What other people were doing or other people were living their lives. They were extreme extremely humble. Um, I think Musa Nembele is the best footballer I've ever played with, and 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 for him to have that humility and um, yeah, and they they were like two older brothers to me. They really looked looked after me and and. Uh, I took a lot of advice for them, really just outside of football and the, and the way I wanted to live my life and and what I wanted to do with, with uh, with my time, with my money, uh, etc. So um, they were two people that I really looked up to and and became very close to and 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 helped me massively not go down that avenue that you were talking about. Yeah. Can you remember a, a sort of one of the pieces of advice from them that really stuck in your mind? It was never like it was never. It was never, um, they would never sit down and, and tell me something. It was purely, I, I guess it's like when you're, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when you're like a parent and you have a, and you have a kid, you watch the way your parent acts, yeah. you know, and, and you follow that. You don't, that, that's the biggest influence, not really, if, you, if you're a parent and you smoke and you tell your kid not to smoke, the kid's sort of looking at you like, well, <laughs> well you're doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I guess it, it, I think it was a lot more just about me being close to them and becoming friends with them and and then watching what they're doing and sort of following that. Yeah. I think what's interesting, Damien, is that there'll be a lot of players that have played with both of those footballers, but they won't talk like Eric does about it. And I think it's sometimes it's easy to give credit to the person that you 
believe impacted you. But actually, quite often, we have to remember the credit belongs to the person that's impacted because they had that open-minded approach to allow themselves to be changed. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. The fact, and, and that was a question I was interested in. Like, did they seek you out or did you seek out their influence? No, I think, I think um, well, I, I got on with them, I think, from, from the start. Like, we got on very well, you know. Um, so there was obviously that side of things and our relationship sort of was built on that. And then, you know, I think, I definitely recognise that those were, those were the kind of people that I wanted to be around. You know that that were that were in, in that kind of way with the way in which they lived their life. Um, I definitely recognise that that was what I wanted to to be around. And that's not to say that there are other guys in that team as well, because I feel like we, have, we I was extremely lucky and we were extremely lucky in that time to have such a great dressing yeah. room. So yeah. you describe the impact on. On, on parents and how we follow often the lead of mm. those uh, uh, those figures in our lives. Would you tell us a little bit about your parents? Because I know you're one of five, but yeah. your background in terms of the decisions they were making had an impact on you and your siblings. Mm. Um, well, they, uh, yeah, both both of them very hard working, very like strong willed. Um, you know, they were they were the, they were brave in their decisions. I think they they you know we moved to Portugal when I was I was seven, and uh, it was really like a off the cuff. And know, how was that announced to it. <laughs> I can't remember. I was six. I was six. I have no I have no idea how it happened. We went on holiday to Portugal first, and then almost instantly, my parents were just like, you know, this is uh, this is where where we should be you know for i think we were all well we were six kids so it was <laughs> so you as you can imagine it was a bit of a, a war zone in the house um so to be somewhere where you could be outside a lot more you, there was, you, you we had more freedom as a kid than if, if i was to compare it to now and looking at um why i live in london and and a way a kid grows up in london you know from a young age i could go to school by myself i could um you know, be with my friends by myself, you know, so we built that independence and, and yeah, making that decision to go to Portugal was, you know, probably, they probably say the best decision they ever made, yeah. And now that as an adult, you, you like, you're able to ask them that, was that part of the reason they wanted to do it, to give the, you and your brothers and sisters that independence? Not so much the, yeah, the independence, the lifestyle, um, I think they just felt as, as we were a big family that the lifestyle, um, would be very different, you know. I'm not gonna lie. At the time, one euro was one pound was two euros, so there was that. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that too. Um, so yeah, it was it was a, it was a mixture of, of factors, and and they they never re and as I said before, they never really um, you know one of the one of the the things I feel luckiest about with my parents was they were never really some people that would just like go with the flow and you know if. If every kid at school had a phone, they wouldn't give you one. You know, it was really they were very independent in the way they thought about those things. So that I was, we were extremely lucky with, yeah. And then they came back to the UK, right? They came back to the UK. And you stayed out there. Yeah. How old are you then? Um, I want to say 15, 16, maybe 15. So it would have been yeah. probably the easier decision to come back with them. So how did you? comes the decision that you were going to stay out there on your own because that feels like a brave call even at 15. Yeah, I I when I was 13 I moved I moved full time I lived at the lived at Sporting's Academy so I'm because we lived about an hour an hour away or so and the Sporting wanted me to and I wanted to and my parents let me you know and and uh so at that point I was already living at the academy and then my parents decided to move back to England for my for, for my brothers and sisters. They were starting to go to university and they were getting a bit older, so they wanted them uh, to go to go to school. And, and then obviously they could move on with whatever they were doing um, and their work as well. So so yeah, the decision. I was really happy. I I, I was so happy at, at Sporting Lisbon. You know that I've been there since I was eight. Um, for me, it's like you know it's my home. That that club is like my club. You know, like the only club I really have that. Um, you know, I was there from eight to twenty, so it's uh, yeah. it's it's my family really. It's a big shout though at thirteen to leave the family home, isn't it, and move into the move in full time to the academy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, w it was uh, obviously at that at that age, you have no idea what's going to happen. But um, what do you think that did for you? 
Um, it was there was positives and negatives to it. I think you know, uh, obviously, I, it's easy to say now the positives outweigh the outweigh the negatives. But if it wasn't to go well, then I probably say the opposite. But um, well, I went to Portuguese school. That, that's when I started going to Portuguese like full time Portuguese school. I was uh, I lived so I was living full time with like sixty boys. I think in, in the academy um, <laughs> from thirteen to like eighteen. So. At that time, at going in at that age, like it's uh, it's an experience. It was it was an experience, um, you know. As the young ones, we we get we get we were given a hard time at I the bet. beginning, um, and then being being an Eng the English kid, you know, I was I was uh, the only English kid there, so that was uh, that was an experience in itself, and um, yeah. But then you ended up being the captain of the of the sporting teams for your age range. Yeah. So What was it? that they spotted in you, do you think, that gave you that extra responsibility? Yeah, um, I was I was very driven when I was young. You know, I was ex extremely driven. When I moved to the academy, I think what that did for me was it just like, it really streamlined my focus, you know, because it was, tra you know, you go to school and training, go to school training, and you're, and you're just constantly in that environment where everyone is trying to reach the same goal. So, it really streamlined your focus and I was I was just that's all I was interested in was was making it and at Sporting they had a great layout and incredible facilities and you train the pitches where you don't young the youngsters would train like the first team pitches are right next next to it you know and you could see you could see across from it. so it was like you know you're just sole focus was was getting over there and um, there was such a clear pathway at, at Sporting you know Edge, every age group, you know, you, players would go through to the first team. It was just, it was just what they did and what they were good at. So, as a youngster, you had, you had extreme confidence in them, and they were extremely confident in their methods. So, um, so it was easy in that way. And then, yeah, just, just that focus, and um, I think that's what, that was probably the things that stood out to them. Probably was, was you know, my work ethic, and and yeah. But we have lots of young people listening to this, Eric, that maybe would find themselves in an environment like that where it would be easy to go with the 59 other kids and th take on board some of those distractions. So what did you learn that gave th th in terms of that focus that allowed you to, to maintain it? Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it is, it is, it's one of the biggest things and problems in football probably for, for me is like, what happens to everyone else and how everyone else all those ones that don't make it how they take how where they go from there you know and 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 uh looking after that pathway um but i think well i i wasn't one in 59 there were there were you know i think the ones that were focused there was more than the ones that <laughs> were maybe being distracted so it was a, it was an incredible environment in that way um extremely competitive one because in portugal you only had you would have uh, Benfica, Porto, and Sporting, and, and everyone would be going. Every good player would be going to those three teams. So it wasn't like here in England where it's a lot more spread out, and I think they have things in, in place to try and stop that as well. So it was an extremely competitive environment. You know, a lot of uh, very good young players. So everyone was kind of you know driven and fighting and and uh, they had an incredible discipline installed in 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 the academy that was something that you know was fantastic for, for so would us. you say more about that what what kind of discipline yeah they had lo loads of things that I, I grew up in a very disciplined household you know it was the only way with six kids so <laughs> so um it was it was quite good going into that but there was a huge, huge emphasis on 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 respect. You know, um, I think it's a, cult, a cultural thing, a cultural thing as well. We, we we had to. So there'd be rules like you had to keep your bedroom tidy. You had to make your bed every morning. If you didn't, you wouldn't wouldn't be allowed out at the weekends. You'd have, you'd have to stay stay at the academy. They had a guy um, called Sir Paulo who was in charge of the bo the boys, and he was this big. Used to be in the army, this big tough guy, <laughs> and he was pretty scary. So no one wanted to no one wanted to go on the wrong side of him. And then yeah, it was all about respect, saying good morning to everyone in the morning. Uh, you had to be good at school. You know, you had to behave at school. You had to you had to perform at school. That was really important for them. So they they really focused on so much more than. Then the football side of things, which I think you know was was so important, 
and um, something that yeah, I think everyone there benefited from. And do you still carry those values today? Yeah, massive. Making a bed is a huge thing of mine. Is it? <laughs> it's a huge thing of mine because of that. I, I, like, I'll go to a hotel and make my bed in the morning, <laughs> just because it's just like I don't know. I feel like it's you know I have to start my day in that way. There's um, something important about that though. We had a, a we have a, a members club called the High Performance Circle, and we had um, an American military general talk to us on there, and he's written a whole book about making your bed, starting yeah. your day right. Yeah. And I think sometimes people listen to this kind of a conversation with a you know a Premier League footballer and they think the things that you do to get yourself to the elite level are a million miles away from where they are. Yeah. But they're not, are they? No, no. Ian McGee and Serena McGee came on and talked about world class basics. Mm. And that kind of is what you're talking about, right? Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I think there are tons of things that I think can relate to to anything anything you do. Um you know, I live I live with both my brothers and, and you know, they're on their journeys and they're extremely focused and motivated and very hard working and and they do we all do all three of us do a lot of the similar things because that's what um you know makes us feel feel good I think and, and feel in the best possible place to, to do our jobs. So I think uh, a lot of things are transferable depending on what you do, yeah. So you come back to England in the end. Yeah. You go to Everton. Yeah. Um, I'm interested, A, in how much of a culture shock that was. <laughs> and B, I know you're unhappy there, but then extended your contract. Yeah. Those two things I find fascinating. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I really wasn't happy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was probably the best thing I ever did. And it was something... Um, so how old were you, Eric? I concert? was 16 or 17. I'm, ter right. I'm terrible with these right. things. But so basically... It was a, the problem was at Sporting. It was a bit of a mess at that time, um, and I had always played up an age group. And then you get to they have under 18s and the 19s become one age group. So I was under 16 playing with the under 17s. Then the under 17s became under 18s, but they're competing with the under 19s to play. So they kept me with the under 17s, which was my age group. So I was sort of just stagnant and really not going anywhere and and uh at, yeah at the time my, my dad said to me like you know uh it's all it's all his credit because he said to me you know you need to you need to go somewhere else you you can't be uh you know he'd seen things in me like I, I started to have bad attitudes of certain things and complacency and those kind of things and and um yeah he said like you need to get go into a different environment because otherwise you're just standing still really so um yeah, I spoke to a few English clubs at the time and, and Everton, because it was a strange deal where I was only on a loan. So there was all the risk on their side. And, and to be fair to them, they were amazing with me and, and um, you know, took that risk. And, and David Moyes was the manager at the time. So I went there for six months, um, really off off the back of that, off my dad, my, my dad really telling me, you know, you need to get out of here. And, I, and it was it was the best thing I ever did at that age, you know, and who would, I don't really know what would have happened to me if I had stayed because I wasn't in a good place. And it was just the biggest cultural shock for me. Um, you know, I was, I was very much Portuguese at the time, you know, like in every way, you know, my mum was more worried about me forgetting my English <laughs> right. because, you know, my whole life was in Portuguese school, go to leave school everything everything the only time i spoke english was with my my parents or my my brothers and sisters so um all my friends portuguese so so in that way it was just the, a huge shock in every way the way they trained the way the building was the the city the weather just you know leaving what was the single hardest thing to deal with for you <sighs> the single hardest thing um i think just being by myself like I'm not someone that likes being by myself ever, and just being by myself in in a in a country I didn't I didn't know anyone in a city I didn't know anyone, um, and then and then I think the second hardest was just just the football was so different, the intensity was so different, and it was it was really like you know a kick up the backside for me really, and uh, I really say to everyone I, I went there a boy and I really. I came back a man and that, that's really what happened, yeah. Which is a really interesting sort of insight. But what I'd like to explore, Eric, is that there'll be lots of people listening to this that have those moments like that in the face where you've been hit with the culture shock and the intensity yeah. of it. What did you do to knuckle down and overcome them? 
Um, it was well, like I've 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 experienced it before because when I went to Portugal, I experienced that same thing. You know, when I was little, my mum loves telling me this story. She, uh, I was playing. Uh, we were we were in the Algarve, and I was playing for a team called Lag, which was a sm small team. It's where I first started playing, and it was a gravel gravel pitch, and I was terrified. You know, I really. I couldn't speak a word of Portuguese and my mum literally the first few times would throw me over this this fence you know <laughs> I'd be like I don't want to go I don't want to go probably crying and she'd just throw me over the fence and say like you know off you go <laughs> you're not coming home so um so yeah like I'd, I've been in that environment before so it was all about just trying to embrace it you know trying to em embrace the culture embrace embrace the club um embrace the city and um and i tried and i tried to do all those things and um you know it's fantastic i have i have i have friends you know ross barkley was there at the time um so i, I built friendships from it um that i that i keep to this day chris long he plays in he plays in scotland now um and then people had a huge impact on me alan irvine um who, who was with david moyes yeah. at west ham uh, last season had a, a huge impact on me david moyes was was incredible with me at the time you know um and after the second year, uh, you know, he, he had asked me if I wanted to stay stay on from there. Um, and you know, even when I see him, we played West Ham the other day, and 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 seeing him there, you know, it's always nice when I see him, and he's always been so great for me. So, um, but you weren't happy. So why did you stay? M my dad again. <laughs> he he was the one that sort of for forced it upon me, you know, and and um, yeah, like they they Everton wanted to keep me for another year and. And uh, I think I just I just played for, started playing for England's youth teams as well um, at that time, and there it was, there was a great setup there at Everton. In you know I was with I was with the reserves and and uh, you know I trained sometimes with the first team, but very very much just with the reserves. And and um, there was a, a lot of really good players: John Lundstrom, Ross Barkley, Shane Duffy, um, Mustafi who was at Arsenal. Um, so there was there was a lot of good players there. Alan Irvine was there, who was, you know, I thought was a, a fantastic coach um, and, you know, so good at developing players. Um, so, yeah, it was a great club, great setup. And, yeah, I was sort of playing at a level where if I went back to Portugal, that didn't really exist mm. at the time because they didn't have a, a B team or a reserve team at the time. Ne the year afterwards, that's when B teams came back in Portugal. So I was playing for a reserve team, which was a lot more already like a manly football yeah. And uh, yeah, it ended up being yeah great for me. So had you got to a point here where, thanks to your parents, you'd got comfortable with being uncomfortable? Because right from your mum, well, from your parents taking you out of the UK, then yeah. your mum chucking you over a fence and making you play <laughs> football, and then you making the decision yourself to leave home, and you talked about strict parenting and a pretty strict academy by, by the sounds of things. Yeah. And then your dad basically saying to you, you're now too comfortable at sporting, you need a new challenge. Yeah. This is this is all resilience building, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Like, I think like comfort is the enemy, you know, is the ultimate enemy. So, um, it, you know, that I ne I I always think I strive in an uncomfortable environment. You know, I think when I get chucked into that moment, in that moment, I always feel like you know I, I'll swim. <laughs> so, um, and I think that just I think that just comes naturally from my upbringing, you know, moving to Portugal and 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 uh, we we moved quite a bit in Portugal as well, moved moved around and moved school a bit, so like I was always having to adapt and and ad uh, you know adapt to to my surroundings and 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 culturally as well. So um, so I feel like m my whole childhood I was sort of doing that, so it comes naturally to me. Yeah. So what would you say is the best tip then, Eric, for anyone that? wants to get out of that comfort zone and embrace that mo those moments of discomfort from your own experience. Well, it's exactly that. It's embracing it, you know. I think that's the key thing. Um, and, I, you know, I see, I see it when players, when players come from abroad to the Premier League now and, um, and it happened to me when, when I came to Tottenham again, you know, because I'd gone back to Portugal and I came to Tottenham. I think... The most important, I think that's the most important thing is to, to embrace it, you know, to, to have an open mind to it, to, um, you know, to be open to those uncomfortable situations and, 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 and get through them, you know, and they won't be, they sometimes they're not enjoyable, but you'll feel so much better for it the other side. So, um, 
I think, you know, it, it's something that um, Pochettino, you know, he, he preached at Tottenham when, when he was there about in training, he used to try and make it as uncomfortable as possible for us because then it was all about in the game, it would feel so much easier because, you know, you've gone through all, all this stuff, this like, all these situations where it's made it almost impossible for you. So then in a game, everything is is easier. So I think it's just taking that into every every aspect, really, yeah. We have a lot of teachers listening to this podcast, a lot of CEOs, a lot of parents, and they're all doing the same thing, really. They're trying to get a group of people to buy into their beliefs and their methods. Mm. I'm fascinated to know, from a player's point of view, and you know, as you know, Maurizio has been on the podcast, Yeah. What, from a player's perspective, did he do to get you to all buy into his methods and his approach to football? Um, well, well, you didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have a choice. You had to. Um, yeah, I think that's an important. I think that's a really important uh, side of things, you know. And 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 now I'm experiencing it, you know, with, with Conte as well. Is is like it is my it is my way, you know. And that that's very much, I think. Uh, that their style you know is like that they they believe 100 percent in in what they do and and you know you, you, a kid's not stupid no one's stupid you you feel that you know you feel when someone when when someone has that belief in in what they're doing that rubs off on you and and, and you believe it too you know um and i think that was you know with maurizio that was uh you know one of his one of his best qualities was he was he was so consistent, you know, in his in no matter no matter the the high or the low, the consistency in, in him and his coaching staff's behaviour and the way that we worked every single day, you know, if we won or lost, nothing changed. It was that consistency in the way we trained and the way everyone behaved um was so important, you know, and, and um so it's that yeah, for me it was that word again, that consistency and, and and then he was great. We were, we were all so young at the time, you know, me, Harry, Deadly, Christian, uh, Ben Davies, um, obviously Jan, Musa, but there was a lot of young players there. And he would just work us and work us and work us, you know, and, and just trying to take every little bit of ounce of potential that we had and, and try and squeeze it all out of us, you know. And it was, uh, yeah, it was the best environment for a young player. So yeah. when we met him, he, he, he spoke about a concept that really intrigued uh, us about universal energy. How did you interpret that? What did you understand by that? Um, I think it's about. I think it's about. Well, if the best way I could explain it, like on a football on a on a on a football pitch, is there are moments. There are moments that you you have games, and as players, as individuals, you have moments where where he would always say he would always say to me Eric don't think just do it you know just don't think and it's about being in that 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 flow state you know where everything is everything is uh it's not it's never reactive it's just you're just proactive and and everything is just flowing and you know you you you, you like you can build that within a team where there's that energy where it's just it's just natural. It's just one step after the other, and and you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to think where to be. It's just happening, and I think <clears throat> he would create that in so many little things, like your body shape or the way you moved in a certain moment. You you you'd repeat the drill over and over and over again, and then you take and in the game it would just it was just natural. You know, even in all the gym work we did, all the gym work was relative to what we were doing, the movements you'd make on a pitch. So it was always just built everything was just built in for that energy to exist where everything was flowing as one you know and can you get yourself into a state of flow for a game of football yeah i think so 100 percent. and how do you do that i don't know because it doesn't happen always you know um f for me it's very emotional um i feel like the more the more um like the more emotional the game is or, or something I, I find myself in it more you know or if something angers me or that there, there's that there can be one thing that will just anger me and put me put me in it so I you think. like that if early in a game someone sticks their elbow in your ribs or yeah is aggressive towards you that's a good thing is it for you yeah that that's a good thing for me yeah for sure like i i i just like that i like being in an environment where you know, i like being in an environment where there's there's um 
there's like an an uh, an energy between everyone. That ev- you really feel that everyone is working towards the same thing, where everyone is um, focused on the same goal. And to be around, it, to be in that kind of environment, you know, and and to be working for, for, in my case, you know, working for a manager in which I believe in and I trust and and. I, you know, have that confidence in makes a huge difference to me. Well, you know, the documentary, um, what was it called? The documentary they filmed oh. behind the scenes? Oh, all or nothing. nothing, yeah, yeah. You know, and you, I think it was you, you all came in the dressing room and someone was being critical. And was it you that was, you said, name names, name names? <laughs> yeah, Was yeah, that yeah. you? Yeah, that was me, yeah. And is that because you, th- you thought they were aiming that at you and you wanted them to front up and be totally honest or or did no, you I think it was who, better for the group to just, I just think if you've got criticism tell people yeah i just don't like it if like you're just going to be um like vague and vague about it you know i'm i'm not i'm not really a, a, a screamer at all you know i'm not very like contra uh confrontational person but um i, I always find it difficult because right after a game you know i can be thinking a million things and loads of people are and you can say things that you can say things that you're going to regret, you know, because it's an it's an emotional environment. So um, that those things are going to consistently happen and will always happen, and and that's part of part of the game and part of the reason I, I love it, you know, is that emotion. Um, no, but that in that instant, it's just about you know, I, I just want people to be upfront and 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 uh, if you if you if you have something to say, to someone, you know, say it, you know, don't yeah. don't be vague about it. And that's it. how you deal with things. Up yeah, that's how total I. Tr- honesty. That's how I try to. You know, I don't think I'm perfect, but um, I'm definitely not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I try to be. Yeah. I remember yeah. Frank Lampard. He came on the podcast, didn't he? And he said communication so important because if you don't tell the players exactly your plan and what you're thinking, they just fill in the blanks. Yeah. And then yeah, they fill yeah. them in wrong, and then yeah, it yeah. creates toxicity. Yeah, one hundred percent. You, you, for me as a player, I want to have complete clarity, and you know what, what. Um, what is my job? What is the team's? Uh, what is the team's um, style? Or how does the team work? How, what do we do? You know, I think when you have clarity in all of those things, or as you know, as a player, everything becomes so much easier. You know, you can, if it's very clear what the manager wants, then you can start talking to other players and saying, like, no, that's wrong because we both know it's wrong because he said it. You know, and if it's not said then it's a debate because you, you don't you don't know who's right, what's wrong, what's right. So I think, you know, <clears throat> the 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 manager being uh very clear in what he wants and his ideas and how he wants you to play, I think gives everyone clarity and makes it easier to to, you know, confront people about situations. So how comfortable would you be in managing upwards then? So if you're not getting that clarity from a manager how comfortable are you in going and demanding it? Yeah, I've been, I've, I've been, um, I've been quite lucky with with the managers I've had, and you know, all the way through my my youth system, all the way through my youth system, I, I would get that, you know. So, I've been really lucky. But I think if if you need it, you you know, you you, you need to ask for it because at the end of the day, it's gonna it's gonna benefit everyone. Yeah. And so, how would you so to go back to that theme of universal energy and the idea of people being in flow. How would you as an individual tackle somebody that's bringing a negative energy into a group then? Um, it's it's difficult in a group environment, I think. Um, I, I, I think like the, the more you have doing things the right way and bringing that right energy, it becomes very difficult for, for one person or two people to affect it, yeah. I think. I don't think they have a choice, but to be to be a part of it really so i think it's it's about building that 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 solid foundations within the group and having a real core to the group um and then i think the ones on the outside don't really don't really have a choice but to buy into it and be a part of it so yeah. when you started then you you by definition you'd have been on the outside of that group and had to make your way to the core yeah obviously when i arrived at tottenham i was just i was just a uh, you know, a twenty-year-old boy, so so um, I didn't really know what I was getting into. Um, so yeah, no, it's about. I think obviously in every environment, I'm a strong believer that you need like you need that you need that leader figure who 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 um, who everyone sort of uh, 
feeds to and that there is as I said no you know with, with Maurizio and, and and the manager now just there is that you know I, I enjoy being in that environment where it's like it's it's their it's their way or the highway you know and there's no room for discussion and I I, I think that's the best environment to to be to be successful as a team you know because otherwise I don't I don't it's not for me as a player to say how we should be doing things how we should be playing that that's the manager's job and and uh, the better he does it the, the easier it is for for everyone as players a key element of course is adapting isn't it as a footballer yeah so let's talk about when a manager leaves and a new manager arrives so Maurizio Pochettino leaves Spurs how do you all find out about that sort of thing um well we f we found out um through the club, the club told us, you know, before before it became public, and um, and and yeah, and then. Did you get a farewell or anything with? I, I saw him. Yeah, I, I saw him. I saw him. Uh, I went to his house and saw him uh, after we didn't. I didn't see him at the training ground. So I, I saw him at his house, and um, you know, I had a had a had a you know, probably like three four hours with him, which was really nice, and <clears throat> you know, obviously. Um, you know, just disappointing that things ended in that way at that time. But uh, yeah, that that is football. Yeah. And what's the one the one thing you carry from that period in your career playing under him? What was that? As you had that three or four hours in his company and you left, what was the thing you thought? You know what? This this guy gave me this, and I'm never gonna let it go. Um, well, he gave me, he gave me my my chance in the Premier League. You know, when I, when I arrived at, at Tottenham, I, 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 as I said, I was 20, and I had no idea like what situation I was going to come into really from an individual point of view and he he uh, I was there I was there for two weeks and he played me uh played I played my debut against West Ham away and uh and I'd been and yeah and I'd been there two weeks which I I, I, I didn't know how many games I was going to play in the first season I didn't know like really what I knew they wanted a young center back and that's that was the their place I was there to fill you know so yeah, he he installed all his faith in me, and I think he did that over and over again with with, with players. You know, where he didn't think at all about the. It was like if you were if you were ready, you were ready. You know, and it didn't matter the occasion. As I said, you know, West Ham away, it was just you know off you go, <laughs> and uh, he was he was great like that. Yeah. And so then in comes Mar um, Jose Mourinho. Yeah. As players, how much sort of knowledge do you have of who's coming in or do you find out the no same we just as we, the rest of us? none yeah we, we uh just found out again through the club the club tell us before it becomes public and and um yeah that that that, that that's it really so jose comes in <laughs> new era yeah what does he do to set the tone with the players how did he instill a new culture at that football club on day one um yeah, every man uh, like I hate to compare managers when people ask me like when a new manager comes or normal because every manager is different. Yeah. Every manager comes with different di a different skill set, um, different ideas of the way they want things to be in the building, on the training field, around match day. So it's all about yeah. Um, he 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 came in with a real energy. Um, I think he was really excited to be working again. I think he hadn't been working for a little while, so. I think he was really excited to be working again, and and um, yeah, he came in with a f you know a fantastic energy and was trying to just boost I think the confidence of of all the players. Um, obviously, having gone through the period that we had at the time, um, and obviously it's, it's Mourinho, you know, so he comes with uh, he comes with a lot of charisma. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, and and then like you know you, you just got to try and uh, everyone starts from zero, and it's that thing about you know trying to find your feet uh, under a new manager. So as a kid that grew up in Portugal when he first came to prominence at Porto before going on to yeah, Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, Like, that must have been quite exciting for yeah, you. Yeah, that too. was very, very, obviously for me it was exciting in that sense, you know, because um, growing up there's like, there's two people really in Portugal, you know, that um, are like, like godlike figures, you know, so um, so obviously he's, he's one of them, you know, and... Uh, yeah, you you just you never imagine that time's gonna work like that, you know. Like playing with Rooney for England, and I was at Euro 2004 in Portugal, and you know I I won this. My sister won a competition with school, and she got to go. We got to go and watch England train, you know. And so like you know, 
Rooney's their player, you know. I got a picture of him afterwards. I, was, I don't know how old I was. I was really, really young. And you never imagine that time's going to work like that. That one day, you you know, I got the chance to play with him. And then, when I was a kid, Mourinho's manager. You never think time works where yeah. I'm going to end up <laughs> so being managed by him. So how do you make that him. mental adjustment then of being like the, you know, the kid having your photo with Rooney to then being a pair and telling him to run a bit harder or <laughs> asking him to pass you the ball. I never told him that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I never told him to pass the ball either. <laughs> it was a lot better with him. Um, yeah. Uh, no, it's... it's it, those things just sort of, you know, you just... you just. Do you think about them or not? Do you... Are you... You mm, accept... No, you just sort of... Yeah. You just sort of... Uh, it just is what it is in the moment. Like you, you, you sort of, you start to build it up. You start to, you know, I went to Tottenham and then I was playing with players that, you know, I was like, oh wow. And then, and then you're playing against players and you sort of just, that sort of just builds up and up and up. Um, so then, you know, to play with, play with him for England was, was incredible. And, and uh, yeah, something I'll, ne I'll never forget that. And, and uh, just the way he was as well with like, us young there was a lot of young players at the time and the way he treated us you know I'll never I'll never forget like the way he treated us and the way he'd like you know he'd sit next to you on the bus or he'd come and sit with you at dinner and and um really like looked after you and and that was uh that was something I'll never forget yeah so have you built processes or ways of coping when when the pressure is great I mean a really good example would be taking the penalty for England and you yeah. know None of us need reminding of our history with penalties. Mm. <laughs> you stand in there, you put the ball down on the spot. Yeah. Do you think about the country, the people watching, the history with penalties, the fact that it's all on you, that everyone's holding their breath, <laughs> that this goal puts us into the next round? Like, what? Can you take us through the, the yeah. mental story when you knew you were taking that kick? Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny because. Portugal knocked England out of penalties twice, you know, and I used to get <laughs> so much um, stick about it, about it, you know, at the academy. And, um, but I felt, I felt uh, Portuguese in that way, you know, where, like, I felt like I have the Portuguese thing about taking penalties, you know, like, I grew up about it, I grew up with it. At, at sporting, yeah. you know, as in the confidence thing, like, the confidence yeah. thing, yeah. Like I feel like I had their confidence, to, like their confidence, to take a penalty right. or, or do one of those things, you know, because I, I was uh, I was one of them in in that scenario where we, you know, we'd practice penalties loads and and all that kind of stuff, and I was around them doing it, so so there was that kind of aspect to it, and then I didn't really feel attached to like the the. I didn't feel attached to, to England's penalty like disasters, you know, um, well not disasters, but penalty losses in the past. Yeah. As a fan, I did. Well, like, they I were was, disasters. Don't was, worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was devastated. I was like, as a kid, I was devastated, you know, um, when England lost on penalties and and um, but in terms of like taking penalties and that kind of thing, you know, I I felt quite a bit detached yeah. from so it. That you didn't feel the weight of that baggage or anything. No, obviously there was a lot of pressure in that moment, but um, I think for me the biggest thing is practice, and and I I practice them so much, you know, and I, I always do like Harry always practice them the day before a game, and I'll always take a few, you know, I'll always I'm I know I'm not taking them tomorrow, you know, but um, so I'll consistently do it, and then you know just my my biggest thing is 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 uh, is practice and training, so like if you practice practicing something enough that you know you feel comfortable it, it to then to then do it and leading up to the leading up to the world cup we practiced them loads and i'd always i was always practicing practicing them all the time and and uh popey uh, burnley he was he was the keeper you know and uh he's someone that like would never get any credit you know but he would like stay out there and say penalty after penalty and i was always practicing to my bottom left and he knew you know he knew i was always going there so it was like this challenge to try and score because it you had to hit like a great penalty which i really didn't do in the, in the penalty shootout <laughs> but you had to hit like a great one to score because uh he knew it was going there as well so it was all about just for me it was all about practicing and then and then when it came to the penalty, I actually, I was terrified when I was standing there waiting because I knew it was coming to me. I was absolutely 
terrified. So what did you do to manage that then? That those for that time? nothing. It completely overtook me. I was just, <laughs> I was just thinking. Two things happened. Um, they missed before me, and it became the penalty to win instead of the penalty to to stay in. And it. were you alright with that, or did you think, oh, oh, know. that felt so much better? Did it? Because if, if I if I missed, we we kept yeah. on going with the penalties, and and then. You know, I spoke about this with, with Harry as well because I think you know well, he can play better than me. But I think he experienced something similar where, when I when I got there to take it, I was I was actually just really really calm and and like I, yeah, I was convinced I was going to score. I, you know, I could have missed because it was bad. It was actually a bad penalty, but I was really calm in that moment and um, yeah, I, I I just in it was just like. Okay, so you've gone one. from being terrified to then stepping up and putting the ball down and being calm. Yeah. What changed in uh, apart from like you now playing? I think just that to practice and routine. Like once I just got into that, I just got into like the routine of what I had to take a penalty. You know, like I just put it down to like the steps I wanted back, and and I was just in that moment, and and it was to win it. So, so I was, was it Pochettino's advice of don't think, just do in that moment? And yeah, but I think with practice that just with enough practice that just exists you know yeah. where where you're not thinking if 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 you do something over and over and over again it just becomes um it becomes second nature to you and uh yeah when i was when i when i stood up to, when i st stood up to take it it was it you know the fact that it was to win it instead of thing did change m everything for me in that moment and uh you know, I just thought, you know, it's great, great, <laughs> great, great opportunity. Um, so yeah, no, and uh, you know, it was a great moment for us and in that in that tournament. And uh, you know, it was probably like that thing that really uh, everyone was kind of fearful of, and to go get through it was amazing. So if you were in a similar situation again, maybe it's not a penalty kick. Like, what would you do differently next time, and what would you do keep as the same? Um, uh, I don't. I don't know if I'd do anything differently. I'd, I'd try and take a better penalty if it was a penalty. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I was. I was. Uh, I was really happy with the way like like I prepared for it, and you know we were all preparing for it from from a long time before, and and uh, yeah, I, you know I took it. I take it all the way back to like my Portugal days where with those penalty shootouts and. You know, it was a real thing. Like I don't know, I I've never really in English academies too long, but in Portugal, it's like it was just a real thing. That like at the end of training, you know, you take penalties, you take mm. free kicks, you stay out there for ages doing that kind of stuff, and so that all built builds it up to that moment. Yeah, isn't it interesting though? Like I don't want to get too spiritual, but when you talk about Maurizio and this universal energy, like you're standing on that football field in your twenties. And the very thing you're being asked to do was the thing that was instilled in you when you were seven or eight years old in a foreign country, almost as a totally different person all those <laughs> yeah. years ago. And the universe has this amazing way sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, of just yeah. giving us things yeah. to deal with. And we, we have the tools in our in our bag. Yeah, yeah. We you know, it's it's um things happen and and uh I feel like you can relate them to so many things that have happened to you in the past. Um and 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 there are moments that you know they're just surreal moments, and there are those moments where you you uh, you know I I always believe that you you do need that little bit of luck, but then there's no luck in then taking it when you get that chance or you get the opportunity and whatever it is, and and uh, you know preparing to you know preparing yourself for that mm. moment, even though you don't know when it's going to come, but staying staying. Uh, on top of it and, and keep going, keep going, keep going, waiting for that moment, yeah. That's very similar to, we interviewed uh, Sio Khaleesi, the Springboks uh, rugby union yeah. captain, we spoke about that, that, a lot of people moan and moan, but then they're not ready when opportunity yeah, yeah, lands yeah. in their lap. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think, that, yeah, it, it, you, you, you've, you've always got to be ready because I can only relate to like my, my profession, but I, so I can't really, speak for others but i'm sure i'm sure it's similar it's just you just never know when it's gonna when it's gonna happen i made my debut for sporting because two right backs got injured and then i i played it right back you know and i made my debut and then i stayed in i took it and i stayed in the first team from then on and you know so there was just that 
you you just never know and it, and it is i think it is really hard to to keep going when you don't know the timeline and you don't know when it's going to come it, it, i think it's difficult to that's where consistency is but is yeah again, that's where it? exactly yeah just the consistency in your behaviors um and trying to consistently improve and get better and um you know i think that's the most that's the most important thing is to no matter how old i am i want to i want to just keep trying to get better and better and and um in, in whatever it is that i'm doing whatever it might be just try to get better and better yeah so can we take you forward then from that world cup to the to the european championships because we were reading that Gareth Southgate had said it was one of the most difficult conversations he'd had to have with you yeah. to say that you weren't going to be selected in that yeah, final yeah. squad. Yeah. But equally, he also said that your response was incredibly mature and you had a long conversation around it. But I'm interested in how you interpreted that conversation and what you chose to do differently on the back of that. Um, yeah, for me, that was probably like, I'd say probably like, um probably the worst moment like of my career probably not going to the euros i think um yeah it was you know i i, I didn't expect it and and um yeah it was difficult for me you know it was it was very difficult to deal with that um but yeah it, it everything you know ev i believe everything happens for a reason and and um it wasn't it wasn't to be and and uh, i've always had a great relationship with gareth ever since in england on 21 so um i've always had a great relationship with him and and um you know there's nothing there's nothing you can do to change the decision so i i, I try to take it and in the best way possible and and you know i think in that phone call that's 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 what i i tried to do and and um you know at the end of the day it was the right decision. They had a great tournament. Do you think it was the right decision? <laughs> you can't do. For me, not me personally, my decision about for England, me. Oh, for you. I see. Um, no, I can't say. But nah. um, you know, it, it's. Uh, I completely respect his yeah. decision, and and um, I know for sure it wouldn't have been an easy decision for him, um, given like everything that we'd been through before. Um, but Gareth's always been really great in those moments because he's he 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 really he really talks to you and really you know is very open and very open with you so that that makes things easier and um, no for me it was just about I just straight away I just sort of reset and you know I thought I'm gonna you know enjoy my summer holidays and and I just looked straight you know I was I was actually with I was with Harry at the time in Portugal and um, you know he just said to me you know. You, you go go um you know you've got you've got a whole preseason and, and take advantage of it and uh you know take advantage of that preseason and, and and be in the best possible shape you know to for the new season and and uh that's really what i tried to do you know is um is uh but did you allow it. yourself any time to like i use the term grieve lightly but yeah. it must have felt like a grieving process did you give yourself any time just to do that yeah, of course. I was ups I was upset for a while, you know. I was I was I had I had like my I was with my best friends at the time. Um and I was with my mum and dad like a couple of days later as well. So like <clears throat> I spent some time with them. I was with Jan Jan Vertongen like an hour after I found out I was I was having I was having dinner at Jan's in uh he obviously he's in Lisbon now, so so that like, you know, I spoke to him for a while. So I just spoke to like the people close to me and, and um and yeah, the, 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 like the, you know, you just got to move on. It, yeah. It's 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 gone, and um, just got to try and uh, get through it the best way you know and how. Could you understand it? Like, could you square it off in your own head the reasons for not making the squad or not? No, I can't understand it because, but that's normal because it's yeah. me. <laughs> I think that's normal because it's me. I'm never gonna bet against myself or 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 or, or um, you know. It, it's it's difficult if it's you you know to ever understand it but um but uh you know i understood his reasons and uh you know and i said as i said like i respected his decision and um and yeah you just gotta you you gotta get over it and and you know i i did look i did take a lot of positive i hadn't had a pre-season for example for 
I can't remember the last time I had a, a full preseason, you know. So that was great for me to have a full mm. preseason and really, you know, prepare myself for the start of the season. And I really feel like I took that into into this season, you know, and, and felt really good going into it and felt like I had a base level of fitness that I hadn't had for a long time. So um, there was all, all of those good things to, yeah. to come out of it for me, um, which, which, yeah, was great. And did you watch any of the England matches? Yeah, yeah, I watched um, I watched Denmark, Germany, obviously the final, um, and I watched uh, the one in Rome. Was it in Rome? Oh yeah, the uh, the four one. Right? Yeah, and by yeah. then did you put it all to bed? Because I think it's hard getting that news. But then seeing the team make the final is kind of I don't know yeah, is that was even harder than you're just thinking, oh, <laughs> yeah. come on, of all no. the times to obviously you're disappointed you can't help but be disappointed that you know such an amazing thing is happening and you're not there um but uh but yeah obviously i was you know i was so happy for them and i've had so many people in that team you know stonesy harry um carl walker um jordan pickford yeah. you know i've been with them since under 21 so um or even earlier you know in some cases so you know for them you know to to for them to have the opportunity and to to win it and play in a fi play in the final and what it must have felt like here in England you know was amazing it's also a reminder right that and this extends to every facet of our lives what is hard for us isn't necessarily bad for us like that was hard and horrible mm. But in the long run, it might not be bad for you. It might reignite the fire if, yeah. if do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 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 of course. You have to take, you know, I'm a firm believer in everything happens for a reason. So you have to try and just um, react in the best possible way. Like there's there's no benefit for me whatsoever to, 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 to sulk about it or, you know, or, or blame other people or, you know, be angry with with uh, with Gareth, or there's just no benefit in it whatsoever for me in that, you know. So I'm not going to waste any time doing anything that was is going to put in jeopardy jeopardy like me going yeah. forward. Yeah, but it's, it comes back to something we talk often on this podcast, which is like things happen that are not your fault. That's a really good example. But how you deal with it is your responsibility. And yeah. if you'd have sulked and got frustrated, well, that's not going to impact Gareth or no. the England <laughs> team or anybody else. There's only yeah, one yeah. person that's going to affect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's you, and I think it can be a, it's a hard mindset sometimes for people to understand that you can still choose happiness, like you can still choose positivity yeah. in the face of unhappiness and negativity. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think it's also about distinguishing, you know, I think it's very difficult as, uh, you know, I find it as I get older, it's it's more and more clear to me, but also like you distinguishing me as a footballer and me as a person you know and having a clear this line between those two people and when you're younger how good you are at football you feel like that's how good you are as a person <laughs> and that's how that's how good or bad you are depending on how you played on the weekend or how you played uh you know how, how you how people perceive you as a footballer and um so you you know distinguishing those two things and and you know, this is this is who I am yeah. as a person, regardless of. Obviously, football determines a lot how I am as a person. My experiences within it, but you know, you you need to you need to have. A, you can't roll with the ups and downs of football uh, on a personal level. You need to you need to know who you are as a person, and and um, and and then you know, football. There'll be up and downs in football, but you have a base to work off of, which is who I am. You know. Which is something that you said you've developed as you've got older. So what was yeah. it that 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 made you realise that you had to uncouple those two? I think it's just maturity, you know. <clears throat> I think it's just I think it really is just maturity. Um I think as you get older you start to understand things. See, understand but I disagree football a bit it, better. I think age can give you experiences, but reflection gives you wisdom. Mm. So it's so getting older, a lot of people would still make those same mistakes. Yeah. It's, um yeah it's it's a tough one I, I i think well yeah the people you know when i spoke about yana musa at the beginning like you know that that helped me you know that helps me make those things so i i i'm sure it's 
what you're around and who you're around and and um you know like i, I live with both my brothers and they keep me very <laughs> but you're <laughs> they keep me very grounded well, though. do you know what i mean you obviously explore you understand the power of exploration in every yeah. sense yeah yeah no i'm i'm um I'm obsessive with uh, like trying new things and and some things stick and some things don't and I'm constantly <laughs> constantly experimenting with things and and trying to get better in that way and thinking about and thinking about what I do and 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 uh, the way I act um, more and more as I get old, mm. uh, again as I get older and there are younger players around me like I think more and more about the way I want the way I want to be to be to be influencing them um but yeah it, it for me it did just i was i was very up and down emotionally and uh, as uh, when i was young you know and it was very much based on how i played you know and and to this day it still affects me a lot because i'm one i am one of those people that thinks a lot about things you know so if uh, if i play badly i'll be thinking about it for a long time um but that doesn't actually help me uh to find consistency in my performance because I need to be able to move on from it and move on to the next game. So can we talk then about the public perception of footballers? Yeah. How how much does it frustrate you and, and maybe other players as well that the public perception of Eric Dyer is entirely dependent upon how you play the game? Yeah, that's... Um, I think that's... that's uh, well, I think in some cases it's, it's, it's normal, you know, because that's what they see. That's that's They're not interested in... <laughs> You know what I do, what I do outside of those yeah. those ninety minutes. You know that's that's really what you're judged on, and and I'm okay with that, really. You know because that's that's what it's about. You know that's what I judge myself on from a professional standpoint as well. Um, being judged being judged on on the way I play football, I have I really don't have a problem with too much. Um, I have a lot more of a bigger problem with the way football is perceived outside of that, and and you know. How do you mean? It just just in general the way the way uh, you know footballers are perceived in 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 so many ways. Um, and what are the cliches about footballers that you hate? I mean, Hector Bellerin came on here, and, oh, okay. and he spoke to us about the fact that you know a foot. We put footballers in a box. So if you come on here and say, I play Fortnite for 15 hours a day, people go, cool, you're a footballer. Of course yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. If you say, oh, I went to Milan to go to a fashion show, people go, why are you doing that? You're not yeah. concentrating on your football. Yeah, it's like exactly. This well, I had that like with Spotless, my app. So um, I get that a lot. It's like, uh, does it does it take away your focus from football, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And it's like, first of all, I would n nothing would ever, I would never let anything ever like affect my focus on football um and secondly that's what i choose to do in my time whereas as you said if someone is playing Fortnite for you know eight hours after training they haven't got no one's no one's got a problem with that because that's that's a footballer and and but that's i'm pretty sure that's a lot worse for you <laughs> than than me you know in my afternoons yeah. choosing to to do that or my days off choosing to do you know something like that but there is that people there's still like such such a problem with that in football where you know and I, I feel like there are so many footballers that I've been around and I am around all the time in, in the dressing room that I've played with who who are so interesting in so many ways and so um, you know like intelligent doing different things um, but but scared to, and they don't have to. It's up to them. Some people mm. prefer to be private, but I feel like there is a lot of fear about about um, being public in in any other way because of the perception that might the reaction that there might might exist, um, which I think is a is 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 a big problem, and it's it's getting better, I think. But um, but yeah, it's it's that thing where people pe people people. Uh, um, judging footballers and and I, I have a real problem with it with like footballers in the press for doing something stupid as well you know because they're like they're, I'm 27 you know <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm seen as as like getting getting to like you know I'm mature in a football world at 27 you know and a 22 year old boy does something stupid yeah 
and uh, one stupid thing, he can do one stupid thing and, and it will snowball. That image of him from that moment will snowball, you know, and and he's 22. Yeah. Can you expect <laughs> you know? too much of them? On a, on a human level, yeah, 100%, 100%. And that's not to mean that uh, it's right what they've done or that, you know, if he did it again, I'd be angry. You know, if he did it a second time, I'd be like, well, mm. you're an idiot. <laughs> but when when you do it first time at, at that age, you know, um, yeah, it's it's just it's just I, I have friend I have friends, you know, my age and you know, so and it's just so it's strange, it's it's uh it's completely normal at that age to people to be making mistakes and to be doing stupid things at that age when you're in you know, you're thrown into this environment, um is uh is extremely difficult to handle in many ways, like the the fame, the money, the the pressure the the demand on you you know at that age it, it's it's a privilege and it's and, and uh you know we're, we're extremely lucky and people love to go down that road like oh you should be happy you're, you're playing football you're da -da -da, whatever um but that's not the way he's seeing it <laughs> you know um and yeah so i just think at times it's just it's just like you know, I I know players that are perceived a certain way, yeah. and then you're with them, and or I don't know them, and then I meet them, and I'm like, oh, even yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh wow, you know. How, how would you like people to perceive footballers? Like, what? I'm sure you all talk about it. What do you just? What is the thing that footballers want from from the public? Um. I don't know. I'm not like I'm not sitting here. I'm I'm not sitting here like complaining or anything because, you know. It, it's rough. It's rough out there yeah. for everyone, you know. Um, but I would just, um, just you know, it, like everything, just a little bit more understanding. I think for certain situations, just understanding, um, you know. And and when you see ex footballers talking about it, that's even more of a problem because it's like, well, you've been there. Yeah. <laughs> you've been there, so you should have a better understanding than anyone. Um, so yeah, it's just a bit more understanding in those moments. I'm not defending at all all there are, there are behaviors and things that have happened that, that I'm not yeah. defending. No, it and, makes and, perfect sense what you're saying. And, and, I know also. Custo and repeat customers I'm not defending Correct. either. But, but also you sit here and you say these things and you start thinking, oh, I don't want people to to interpret this as I'm defending footballers that behave badly. Yeah, no. I know, and that's the problem, yeah. isn't it? Like. It's almost like people are desperate to m misunderstand what yeah. some footballers say because yeah, it suits yeah. the narrative of footballers are lazy, footballers don't care, yeah. you know, and that's not the case. Not at all. I, I'm j I'm just a huge defender of football in, <laughs> in general because I'm in that dressing room, you know, and I see them, you know, and like, and I'm, you know, I'm looking at them, and I'm, I, I don't want to say names, but like, you know, y you know, I'm looking and thinking like you, you. You're such, a, you're such a good kid. You're such a, you know, um, professional, whatever, whatever. And that's the perception mm. because of you did something stupid when you were. The problem is you can deal with it. The sad thing is the young players where it actually damages them because they can't deal with it. Yeah, massively. More and more with, um, you know, social media is is just is just um, is a huge huge pro problem. Uh, in many, many ways, you know, like I see it, I'm on the bus after a game and I see like, you know, you can see players like, you know, and they're, they're, they're scrolling through there. What are they Feeds. looking for, do you think? I don't know. I don't know. Um, you, you, you know, you're looking for instant gratification or if you play badly, I don't know why you'd want to look at it, but people do anyway. Do you go there? Do you do it? No, I've, I'm, uh, I'm completely off. Like I have accounts, I have an Instagram, but I don't have Instagram on my phone. Yeah, and, and uh, that's something I've done now for. Uh, Did it affect you? It affect uh, not so much from a football point of view because I would, I would obviously you can't help but see stuff. So obviously, and if you see stuff, it's gonna affect you. There's people yeah. that say it doesn't. I just don't believe them. <laughs> um, but. 
just I was just I, I, I you know I'd just be addicted I'd just be constantly on it and constantly looking at what other people are doing and and um so I just yeah I, I came I, I've been I would delete it and then reopen it and delete it and then I deleted there. it like this season a while ago or quite a while ago right at the beginning and I really said to myself like this time because I am just a happier person when I'm off it so See, yeah. there's a theme, it, like a, a couple of times in this conversation, Eric, you've spoken about focus, about when you first went to the academy in Lisbon and there was that real like singular focus. And yeah. then you talked about lockdown gave you the ability to focus and simplify things again. Yeah. So that seems to me that that's when you're at your very best. Yeah. And yet you've spoken about from um, when you come into this world of being a Premier League footballer, the fame, the hype, the noise that surrounds you. So what's been the best technique you've learned that still uh, that allows you to maintain that focus? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, well, to maintain my focus, I'm I'm like, <laughs> I, so when I do get interested in these things, you know, they can sort of take over my life, you know. So I like. Um, and and so it's about contro about controlling that and then and then um just keeping things simple keep, keeps my keeps keeps me focused um and then routine like i really i really need like routine in in, in my life like I, I need like routine about the way in which i i go about my day and if if i start to like lose that then i just feel out of control so um so routine really, really helps me and um, like keeps me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> and for any young people listening to this, and there are many who would dream of having a career like yours, the power of communication, whether that is having a group of people around you that you really trust. Um, yeah. You know, we've had quite a few footballers on here. Tyrone Mings is a good example who he speaks to a psychologist before every game. Yeah. Having that outlet, who who do you go to? Um. I go to yeah, my mum and dad, you know, like for for most things. When, whenever I'm gonna make like a, a serious decision, my mum's the last person I speak to. Um, just you know, I go, like to get her okay, really, you know, and like it's it's good. Um, and yeah, my mum and dad, uh, my brothers. Obviously, as, as I say I live live with them and very very close to them, and you know, we we talk a lot about well I talked a lot about them and you know we talk in in general we talk a lot um and then my friends yeah you know um my my close friends uh close friends within the club close friends of out, out outside the club um yeah so just within that group of people depending on what it's about I, I'll, I'll speak to people within that and it is just it is the mo <laughs> the most important thing to to have open communication and it's something I've struggled with in the past, you know, cause I feel like I keep it all in, you know? So, um, tr yeah, having open lines of communication where you can just let free of everything, um, is, is important. But I think also just communicating in the right way as well, you know, is something that I try and focus on. Um, what do you mean by that in the right way? Well, I, I think that, um, it's everything about how the message is given, you know? So it, if, if you give the message in the right way, that the other person can take it in, in, in the right way. But, so I think a lot of it is about how you, uh, how you portray whatever it is you want to put across to someone. Um, so yeah, that, the way in which, the way in which uh, people, well in my case, the way in which people to speak to me um, how how that affects me, or if I'm speaking to someone about I want to put across my thoughts on something, the way I do that because I'm not um, I'm not very calm <laughs> in those situations. So try to try to keep uh, calm and communicate in the right way. Yeah, it's been such an interesting hour and a bit to sit and talk about your route That's and your journey pleasure. and the mindset. So like, I look back on your whole career, having followed it, you know, in my job and and as yeah. a football fan as well. And, you know the time you hopped into the crowd after that defeat to Norwich? <laughs> yeah. My team, by the way. Oh, yeah, it was against Norwich. That feels to me almost like the only time that you've really kind of lost control 
Do you know what I mean? The rest of the time, yeah. yours has been a story of control. Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, in that in that situation, um, I, I am I am quite. I'm I'm not confrontational at all, and I'm very calm. But um, in general, but when something gets me, it really gets me, you know. And there are moments for for everyone. What was it about that that got you? Oh, uh, my family was involved, so. Um, yeah, I've never ever spoken about that situation just because I don't even know if I get in trouble. I don't know if I would get in trouble or not for saying like, like there's a whole situation around it. Um, what I, what I what I've always said is that the way in which I've never ever once had a person come up to the street, come up to me in the street and call me names, yeah. like insult me or gesture towards me in any way you know and i've never i've not once not once in my life and uh, the only situations where it happens is in a football stadium or in a car yeah someone driving <laughs> past yeah. in a car you know and and it really really gets to me because you wouldn't do that to me in no front of me and and you know it's like a, it's kind of like a zoo mentality you know where like um, I'm definitely not comparing myself to a lion, but <laughs> you know, you're in the zoo and you're standing in front of a lion, and but there's that, there's and in a, in a stadium, it feels like there's for some reason there's a there's a there's an imaginary cage where people suddenly feel that they can treat you in a certain way, and I've got absolutely no problem with with um, people talk criticizing me in my football or getting emotional in the moment and and. You know, calling me a name or whatever. Like I loved, I loved that. I love all about that football. Like the next game we played Burnley away, and they were singing this song. <laughs> they were singing like Eric Dyer, your brothers are, and and um, and I loved that. I thought it was hilarious. My, you know, my mum and dad were at the game, and they thought it was funny. I remember going home and I was singing it to my brother all the time because it was just, <laughs> it was just, it was just a funny thing, and I enjoy all that kind of thing. But I just can't understand like. In like in that situation, you know, there was someone just continuously. I was looking; it was where the family sits, so I was looking for my family, and there was someone just continuously, just nonstop, like. And I and I continued looking. I was like, like, what is going? And then that's what that's when it happened because my brother was literally one row above right. this 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 guy in question. Um, so um, then, obviously, he wasn't. My brother wasn't very happy about it. Um, and that's how the whole whole situation happened. But uh, as I said, you know, and then I had the the part I don't really want to talk about because I don't know if I get in trouble or not is the whole FA hearing, you know. But I have some very strong right. strong opinions on the way that it was managed and the way it was handled and and uh, my my punishment uh, if you can compare it to others uh, for other things and. Um, and then, yes, and then just the, I just, I'd like, I can't, I can't say sorry for it. And I can't, I would, t I'd do it again tomorrow, you really? know? And that's because, because it was, it, you know, it, my my brother was there and, and uh, my brother wasn't in any kind of danger, you know, but he was there, you know, so, um yeah, I, it, 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 I could be in a football stadium or I could be in the street or I could be anywhere and my brother could do something and he could be in the wrong, <laughs> but I'd still go, so you know, like because, that. you know, I was brought up on that and, yeah. and you know, my like my parents, um, I'm sure my mum was proud of me for it, you know. And, but, well, yeah. I was going to ask, what did your parents say to you after that? No, I, me my, I remember like we were in the car on the way home and it, obviously afterwards it was like, a crazy thing and and my mom just rang she was really worried that we were not okay so she just was ringing to make sure we were okay and that and that was it you know and then obviously it just wasn't nice from for like my brother because he's not someone <laughs> that wants any kind of uh interest in him whatsoever so in that sense it wasn't nice for him or more than me because i'm i'm kind of used to it yeah you know it comes back to the same conversation about Eric Dyer the person and Eric Dyer the footballer. The reason why when you walk out of here in 10 minutes time, no one will yell at you in the street is because you're Eric Dyer the person. Yeah. The minute you put the kit on and walk out at a football pitch, you're fair game in the eyes of those fans or some of those fans. Yeah. Because 
you're Eric Dyer, the footballer. And I think mm. this whole conversation is a reminder for all football fans, right, to understand that they might be wearing a kit, they might be representing a club, yeah, yeah. but they're a human being yeah. with emotions and stories yeah. and quite often struggles and turmoil yeah, that yeah, nobody yeah. ever sees. Yeah. And I think until the general public see footballers as human beings, I think mm. there'll always be this problem. Mm. And the reality is you reacted like a human being, yeah. not like a footballer. Yeah. Everyone has their breaking point and yeah. it's hard to be critical of someone acting in that way. Yeah, well, that's that's. I, I guess that's my point on the footballers is that the perception, the, like lots of perceptions in some way, and you talk about like the, the car, you, you mentioned before the cars, the tattoo, et cetera, et cetera is you got to remember that if these anyone that is playing in the Premier League or in La Liga or the German football is the most played sport in the world so there are tons and tons and tons of of kids trying to become footballers you know and like you know I'm at one academy where there's hundreds of kids trying to do it and there's you know there's 20 Premier League clubs where there's hundreds of kids trying to do it and these guys, so like the guys in the in every one of these dressing rooms, these were the ones that I guarantee you sacrificed the most, worked the hardest, yep. you know, gave the most. Were you know in all of those ways, those these were the guys that did that, you know, because there was loads of others that were probably in my academy. There were loads that were better than me, you know. There were loads that uh, in many ways you know, amazing footballers, whatever, and and, and they didn't make it. Mm. So these guys were the guys that gave, <laughs> you know, yeah. worked the hardest, did everything to, to make it happen, you know, and, and that's important to remember because, you know, then you look at the cars and you look at the thing, yeah, but they were the ones that were from from eight, eight, eight years old all the way through were the most disciplined, the most hardworking, the most committed, um, and that's important to remember, yeah. Doesn't fit the narrative, that's the problem. But yeah. you're totally right, it is absolutely important to remember. Yeah. And I think, you know, you might have discussed a couple of things with us that you maybe didn't plan on or want to talk about, but yeah. actually, I think having that kind of really honest conversation about how footballers feel about the public perception actually is about the only thing that will help to change public perception. Yeah. You can't expect 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds to, to, to do that. Mm. And actually they're the ones that, they're the ones that get pelted the most, I think. Yeah. So, um, listen, thanks for coming on and, no, thank um, you. and thank being you. honest um, <laughs> about your thoughts. We always finish with our quick fire questions. Oh, okay, cool. So um, we're going to start with three non-negotiable behaviours, just three things that you and the people around you have to buy into. M m like my own behaviours? Yeah, so things that you want to live by. Like uh, uh, things that I do, like making the bed or can be, can be. like standards. Sta so talk about standard things. <laughs> yeah, well, making my bed. Uh, lateness. I'm I'm never late. I hate lateness. I was late today actually. Uh, <laughs> come on, man! Unbelievable. <laughs> but in, in general, uh, yeah, I hate lateness. Yeah. Um, we forgive you. <laughs> lateness. Uh, respect. Yeah. What advice would you give to a teenage Eric just starting out? Um, I'd give a piece of advice that my dad gave me, and, and so I did have it, but it, I, it's always been the thing that stuck with me, which is um, take care of football and everything else will take care of itself. Very nice. Mm. Um, obviously, we're going to have to promote another podcast now, which we shouldn't really do, but I know you <laughs> love Joe Rogan's podcast. Lots of people yeah. do. Most listen to podcasts in the world. We <laughs> listen all the time. If you could recommend one episode of that podcast to people, Ooh, which wow. one would you choose? Now, that is a tough question. <laughs> um, if I could recommend one podcast. Or any other podcast. Uh, it's definitely a Joe Rogan <laughs> um, I I really, really enjoyed... I mean, there is... I feel like I'm... You feel, I feel like, like I'm cheating, cheating on all the yeah. others, yeah. When you <laughs> but I one. feel like I, I really, really enjoyed uh, Guy Ritchie really? on Joe Rogan, yeah. And he has this interesting part. Well, I'm sorry, I'm talking on. <laughs> he has this interesting part where he talks about um, 
wearing the suit versus the suit wearing you. Yeah, and it's like, you can get it on YouTube. There's like a 30 minute clip of it. I've watched it a lot You've of times. You've gone deep on this. <laughs> I've watched it a lot of times. And he just talks about, um, yeah, he, he uh, this in, in, incredible passage on Joe. It's like 30 minutes long. And and he talks about that and... Um, and uh, Why did that resonate with you? Um, well, it's just... Well, if once you've worn a suit, uh, you know exactly what he's saying, you know, because what he he's worn a like the it's about for me, it's about, you know, being being your own man, you know, owning owning your decisions, um not letting yeah, not letting the suit wear you, you know, not letting Quite. not letting anything else um I think you've nailed that. Yeah. I'll try. I try. I didn't. I didn't do guy any justice, but it's a great <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. If you could go back to one moment in your life, where would you go to, and why? Wow. I'm going deep. <laughs> um, if I go back to one moment, you know, I'd pr I'd probably go to. It, it, the Lucas Mora in Ajax when we when we won that semi final, I was on the bench. I didn't play, and it was the most amazing feeling I've ever had on a foot pitch. Was that moment? I mean, like it was just incredible. <laughs> yeah, so that that moment was yeah, amazing. Love it. Um, and the final question, you know, taking into account all the things you've been through, the story, the resilience, the upbringing. If you could leave the listeners of this podcast with one message from you, what would be your kind of one message for them when it comes to living a, a high performance life? What What would you like to say to them? Um, I think to to be to be the hardest per, hardest working person in the room, you know, always. Um, that's I think I think it's to do. To be the hardest working person and to do all the basics right, you know, all of the things that you can control, control them, you know. And I always say it to like young footballers, the things, be on time, you know, be respectful, um, you know, eat right, do the, these things. Because these are all things that you can control and and they're all points. <laughs> they're free points that is yeah. completely up to you. So control the controllables and... And, uh, yeah, be the hardest working person in the room, I think. Top man. Yeah. Thank you for your time. No, thank you for having me. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.